Hey guys, what's up? It's Lengthy Zemet here with a special sideboard edition. We're going to call this episode Six Seconds of Sig for that sweet alliteration that's in your ears right now. We are iTunes official, and of course, some of our co hosts like to poke fun at the fifth member of the cartel aristocrats, but we finally got him on. Uh, he stopped to take a second to drop some knowledge on you all. There's, you know, when you're manipulating the stock market and just like blowing through investments like this guy does if you're following him on Twitter, he's got all that sweet knowledge that even applies outside of magic to the real world. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves as the official fifth member of the Cartel Aristocrats, we can start dropping some knowledge. I really appreciate it. That was a very kind introduction. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sig, and I'm at SigFig8 on Twitter. You can also find me. I write for quietspeculation.com. You can find my articles there up once a week on Mondays. Now, unlike most people uh, that, you know, listen to the Cartel Aristocrats, they know that most of the people that are on the cast have a uh, more intimate association with the game. You know, every week we're actively buying, we're actively selling, we're actively pushing Twitter deals. But you, you've you done something different. You know, you're, what's your portfolio for Magic like? You're, you don't do what everyone else does. You're not actively managing your portfolio. You're doing something different and getting very good results with it lately. So I guess it started probably all the way back in GP Vegas a couple, what was that, a year ago now, a year and a half. And basically, I decided I was going to try to build like this old school deck. I had read about the format. It seemed like it kind of offered the best of both worlds because you got a lot of exposure to older cards that are on the reserve list, um, very safe, sound investments. But also, I, I grew up playing Magic since 97, so not quite 93, 94, but I always knew the nostalgic cards, and that's always... Uh, what caught my attention always had my interest. So I started moving funds into those cards, and then things kind of snowballed from there. So after I built my first old school deck, I decided to build a second. Then I decided I would start to invest a little bit more in some, you know, in these older cards because I was getting really solid re returns. I mean, I, my first Juzam is Jin. I think you were there when I got it. You like to mock me for the process I went through to get it, but it was 70 bucks for this HP copy. I'd like to point out that I was also trying to buy that same copy. He got it before I did. He So, uh, Grand Prix tip, go up to vendors and ask what they have. Sig had asked a vendor if he had a Juzam Jin, and the guy was like, yeah, 70 bucks. And I was looking for one for my old school deck as well at the exact same time. And Sig, was, Sig walked up to me at the Grand Prix, and he's like, hey, I just got a Juzam Jin. I'm like, where'd you find one? Because the room sold out because the car just went up. And he's like, oh, I paid, like, nothing on it. And I... I was pretty sad. But uh, for those listening, what exactly is old school and why is it different than the normal type of MTG finance investment where you buy bulk rares? What, what's the appeal of buying these old cards versus newer cards like modern? So they're a lot rare and they're part of this classic nostalgic feel that uh, is associated with the origins of the game. And so the beauty of it is, I mean, and some people... They, they dislike this component about the format, but what I love about it is you really can only use cards from the original printings, you know, Alpha, Beta, Unlimited. Some, um, some social groups allow revised Channel Fireball, their tournaments that they run that are old school, they allow revised and Collector's Edition, International Edition as well. But really, that's it. And so the, at the end of the day, a car, I, you know, I have one of my favorite cards just for their artwork and flavor is Gloom. I've written about this card a couple times lately. Uh, I have, you know, Beta Glooms are pretty much sold out. I mean, you can probably pay 30 bucks if you want one now, maybe 20, 25 for played copies. There might be one damaged copy on TCG Player, but that's really it. And they can reprint that card as many times as they want in Modern Masters, and I know they won't, but Internal Masters and Commander, and Beta Gloom will still be Beta Gloom and will still be $20 because people want their Beta Black Border versions for old school. So it's a format where you can only use the older old printings, original frame um, of the card, and so it protects you from any sort of reprint shenanigans, essentially. And for those of you who have a gloomy outlook on MTG Finance, one of the coolest things about old school magic is there's this thing called the reserve list. And uh, Sig has shown very good gains if you followed his journey on Twitter or through his articles in both MTG Press and Quiet Speculation on exactly what can happen. Now, when you, you said you bought into some of these cards last year, uh, Wizards has made a promise 
uh, and I'm going to probably butcher this word like I generally do on the cast, that the legal term is promissory estoppel. You know, I can speak Latin, but apparently I can't pronounce that word correctly. Uh, it basically means that they made a promise to the players that they won't reprint these cards. And as a result, investors have been targeting these cards, especially over the last year, and you can see some insane returns. So what are you looking at and what are some of the cooler things that you've seen in this old school format as you've invested in it? Bear with me one second as I am distracted live time by my son who's calling my name. Can, can we take a five minute pause? Yeah, go crazy. I'm going to go ahead and update people since we always stream this live with no editing. I'm going to go ahead and just talk about some of the movers and gainers for the week while Sig deals with this kid. <laughs> so anyway, um, for those of you who don't know, the reason why Sig is never on this cast normally, as we always record in real time and never edit so you get the full cartel experience, he has kids. He wants to pay for his kids to go to college. They're very young. He has to spend a lot of time dealing with them. And so he's using MTG Finance, unlike other people, where they just make money. Um, more like what Corbin Hostler does uh, when he writes for Brainstorm Brewery, Quiet Speculation, and he grinds magic cards in Oklahoma, is what Sig does is he takes all the money that he's made off of his magic cards and he invested it in his kids' tuition for the future. So he's using this game to pay for his kids college and of course sig has no idea what i'm saying because we are recording this live and he walked away to go deal with this kid but that's generally what happens is that he will tweet quite a bit about exactly what is going on uh finance wise because every dollar that he that he has is going to his kids out of this now myself on the other hand i'm using this to pay for college currently while i'm in college so it's definitely a little harder of a of a prospect for sure but you know when sig's spending this money and making money he's not blowing it all on hookers and cocaine or nice steaks he's he's putting it towards a good cause so now that sig's back since we are recording this live for those listening on itunes we also have a video cast where you can see that sig walked off but we really appreciate all the downloads um so what's the appeal of old school? What returns are you seeing with just investing in cards that Wizards has promised they'll never reprint again? It's it's hard to answer that question definitively. I guess it really varies from card to card. So some of the best examples I've got would be Juzan Dijin, which now you see on Star City is like $600 for near mint. I think they have like two copies in stock or something. But I've been monitoring some copy selling on eBay, even like played ones for the high 200s, 300 bucks. And as I alluded to before, my first copy was HP in $70. My second copy I got from Ether Games. Uh, hi, Kyle, if you're listening. And that copy was $110, also HP. And then I picked up a couple more for, again, around the same price. And so that's been a terrific you know, triple up, if you will. Chaos Orb really spiked as well. Um, gosh, there's there's a bunch of random stuff. I made a lot of money in Ernum de Jin from Arabian Nights. I, I had picked up some Unlimited Birds of Paradise that were played in like the 10 15 $20 range and then sold those for like 30 So, I mean, that one's probably less exciting, but you, you get a feel. There's like this giant range. But, uh, well, be the beta Hypnotic Specters, like Star City had tons of those for like 20 bucks for MP. And, you know, since then, I think they've doubled as well. So there's been a lot of, a lot of movement in different areas. Now, of course, for the viewers listening, uh, keep in mind with cards like Hypnotic Specter, Birds of Paradise, and Urnum Gen, uh, these investments are looking pretty fly at the moment. And Sig has done very well for himself lately. Um, now, you know, we, we have seen lately Channel Fireball has started um, allowing old school events. So besides being an investment, these cards are also able to be played with your friends. And it's more of a casual game, primarily when I've played old school. I play it with a beer at a bar with people at the night at the end of the night at a Grand Prix. This is definitely not a uh, competitive format, and that's part of the fun. Is as Sig said, you have this nostalgic format of mainly uh, older thirty-year-old people who played with this played with these cards when they were kids, and uh, they're willing to pay the money for this because they want that nostalgia and the promise and rarity of these cards is really just driving these prices crazy and. Um, for those of you listening, we have had one of the other members of the Cartel Aristocrats admit to even buying out these cards. Um, now, people might not agree with the fact that he did buy out cards on the reserve list, but um, 
it's good money for him. Uh, I'm not going to say who because he's not on the cast. Normally, he he admits it. Uh, if you listen to our previous es- episodes, you'll hear it. But he spent like five hundred dollars buying out Suchi at ten dollars, and it spiked up to fifty, and that was a really good return. Now, the more casual players listening might be like, "Well, why are you doing this? This is evil for the market." You're manipulating the market. And there's a couple of things. It's an artificial spike, first of all. But the amount of copies that he sold at that $50 price made up for all the investment that he put in at the beginning. I believe he sold about 20 copies. So he was already profiting. And now he's just sitting on the rest of the copies. So buying out reserveless cards may not make the community feel happy about you. Like Craig Berry, for example, who just unloaded his moats this morning in Japan for about $100 more than he paid on them, if you follow him on Facebook. That's the guy that bought out Moats. That's the guy that bought out Lion's Eye Diamond. Pretty common knowledge at this point. But just something to keep in mind when buying out reserveless cards, the community may not like you at all. Uh, So, Sig, what are your targets going forward? Are you happy with anything? And do you just want to look at old school cards and see what Star City has in stock? So yeah, first I wanted to make a comment about buying out old school cards. You'll definitely, if you publicize buying out old school cards, you will probably get some whiplash back, some backlash. Sorry, for for it. But you know, I guess that's a personal choice. If you don't care about the community, there's again definitely money to be made there. I personally try not to buy out old school cards, reserve list cards. Um, for one. I don't like to drop tons of money on a, you know, buying a lots and lots of copies of a single card. It's just not my style. Two, if you do that, it becomes difficult to move some of these cards. Just because Beta Sarah Angel now is a bajillion dollars doesn't mean that you can move 100 copies of that price. So be careful with that. Um, I did do that with, I bought a, maybe like 10, 12 copies of Underworld Dreams from Legends at one point, and then ended up just kind of like selling them one at a time on eBay, making like maybe 10, 20% after fees and shipping. So, I mean, not a huge manipulation there, just, but it, you know, it was profitable. Um, and so now, shifting gears, you were asking about um, what else I've got my eyes on right now. Um, so I've been following some of the spoilers. I saw that the new Chandra was really powerful. They say he's the next; she's the next coming of Jace 2.0 and all that, but I honestly don't follow Standard all that much these days. I, I used to a bit. I tried picking up some, some of the lands, like some of the creature lands from, who is it, Battle for Zendikar or Oath of the oh. Gatewatch. Yeah, Oath of the Gay Watch. And I think there was one that went up some, and I made a little bit of money on that, but then the others didn't really move all that much, so I kind of just gave up on it. I do have a couple of random Eldrazi creatures from the sets, but that's really all I have in terms of standard investments. Right now, I focus all of my attention, all my resources on trying to grab older stuff that I see kind of drying up on PCG player. You don't have to, you know, as long as you're not the last person to buy the card, you can generally get in before a a potential spike and get some exposure and then just sit and wait. So Academy Rector, um, I had some store credit to ABU Games recently. They had good price on played Academy Rector, so I picked up a few of those. I picked up um, a couple of replenishes couple of other random you know stuff from the reserve list that hasn't tripled yet and hasn't been bought out yet that's generally what i target you gotta love the live feed of six kids in the background for all the listeners uh, you're just gonna i'm sorry it, it's part of growing up and being a parent i guess luckily i don't have to worry about that yet now of course magic finance is not all glamorous hundred dollar bills and you know spending tons of money traveling the world you can lose money. Have you ever been burned investing in these old cards? Is there anything that you've done wrong that you've learned lessons from while investing? Or has it just been smooth sailing because you timed the market perfectly and you haven't had to worry about anything? Well, I mean, nobody's picked in the market. I mean, the whole goal is to just win more than you lose and then you come out ahead. So, And generally, that's why I try to sell. People tease me because a card goes up a little bit and I sell and take whatever profit I can get. I live by the saying, no one ever went bankrupt selling for profit. And so I will take any sort of gains I can get. Um, you know, I think on the old stuff, I really haven't been burned because it's it's old school stuff. So it, like, it's if, if I'm not profitable on it, I'll just hold it for a little bit longer. Um, you know, I might have broken even on a couple of things because recently I liquidated part of my collection to try to build a vintage deck. And so I might have taken some small losses here and there and some of that stuff. But I mean, I've definitely been burned in the past messing around with you know, modern stuff that got reprinted. Uh, I used to have a birthing pod deck in modern, and then of course birthing pod was banned, and so that hurt me a little bit. 
Uh, I did get out of annual bloom stuff before that card was banned, though I think a lot of this stuff has kind of bounced back. One of my worst was probably Scavenging Ooze. I remember when that was reprinted in Corset and they had that promo, and there was a brief period of time where Star City was paying more than what they were selling for on eBay. And a lot of times I, people see that and they're like, oh, the card's bound to jump because Star City is paying more than what it sells for. But they fail to realize the opposite could happen where Star City could just drop their price. And so I had 30, 40 copies. I think I paid like eight, 10 bucks each. And then they, you see where they're at now. They never recovered. I sold that for a pretty healthy loss. Well, luckily for you, the price of scavenging ooze has been oozing back up lately. It's around $8 TCG mid, so you could have held on just a little longer, and you might have been able to scavenge some of your profits, but it's it's an okay thing. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Now, shifting gears a bit, you're also well-known on Twitter and other articles that you've written about real-life finance, not this magic kid stuff as much as I said while you were gone and you didn't even hear this, that you're using the game to help pay for your kids' tuition, which is a generous thing instead of just blowing it on fancy things and the like. Um, what are you looking at in the, real, in the real world? We have a very um, controversial election would be the best way to put it. We've had other MTG finance people that work on Wall Street come out and say, oh, you should be looking at gold. Oh, you should be looking at getting out of bonds. Is there anything that you would like to talk about in the real world when it comes to finances that you should look into? Should people be taking the money that they make from magic cards and investing it into the real market? Or can you get a better return in the short term in the magic market? That's a really deep loaded question with like hours and hours of potential re responses. I guess first thing I'm supposed to say, you know, you have to choose your own investments. You know, this is your money. So make your own decisions. Don't take any advice. We are not a financial advisor podcast. We are the cartel. Keep that in mind for the listeners. We don't tell you what to do with your money. That's we right. We involuntarily influence you to spend money on our goods and services. Apparently when we buy out cards. But yeah, go ahead and continue. Yeah, so with all of that aside, I guess I'll make a couple of points. First, I always like to explain the difference between magic finance and real life finance as if you want to take a smaller, a relatively you know, small amount of funds and, in, and have a really high return of investment, I generally think that magic is a better vehicle to do that. I think now some of magic finance has evolved in the last couple of years, so it's not as straightforward as it once was. And I think, you know, Jeremy, you've pointed that out multiple times, but I still think in general, you could get better returns from getting in and out of cards from like a during a pro tour and things like that um, with with magic. What what the stock market offers you is scalability, and so if you have a significant amount of money, and people are probably thinking like, well, what's that? So imagine you had ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, and you wanted to invest that, you know. Say taking fifty, hundred thousand dollars and putting it into magic cards to flip over the weekend of a pro tour is a ton of effort. You probably won't even be able to get enough copies and then sell them quickly enough to maximize that kind of return on investment. I know that people who run stores and all that have the time to to manage all of the all those cards and all those resources. I don't, and so I get a lot better scalability from the, the stock market than I do from the magic market. So that's one thing that I do that, that I do like to draw that comparison. And then in general, I mean, I do think that if you thinking long term, you want to have something invested for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, you're planning for retirement. I think we all can probably agree, minus the doomsdayers and the people who ha hide cash under their mattress, we can all agree that the stock market will be around in 30 years. Um, like I, 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 you know, I, I work for a large consumer packaged good company. Um, companies like that will be around in 30 years. Amazon will probably be around in 30 years, even though that's a little bit more, um, more modern. Um, General Electric. So, like these kinds of investments will offer very sound, safe, long-term uh, returns. Whereas I don't know if Magic will be around in 30 years. Probably it'll be around in five years, 10 years. Um, but I think eventually the game could fade away and and it may not die completely there'll always be support for it but i guess i i'm just a little nervous about it you know when you invest in magic you're investing in the life and health of the game and that's what i like to emphasize in some of my articles like yes power is a safe place to park money but power still has some systemic risk associated with the health of the game 
Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see exactly what's going to happen with the magic market and in the years to come. At some point, people, you know, we've seen this relatively recently when vintage prices jumped, when Lotus went from a thousand to seven thousand for a near mint copy in the last two years. Um, it, it's been interesting seeing what the time at which people cash out, because at some point these these twenty to thirty year old. And this is the average magic player I'm talking about here. The people that go to to GPs to FMs, the average twenty to thirty year old will start getting into their later thirties. They'll they'll start prioritizing magic less, and they'll all sell off their collections at the same time. What we're hoping is that there will be enough new players that are getting jobs and that can afford to buy their old collections. But what, as magic gets older and older, older, the cards keep going up because of supply and demand, especially for old school cards. So someone might look, take that thirty thousand dollars in cards and say, I want to new car i'm gonna sell out and you have a lot of people continuing to do this when you look on the high end page you see six figure collections out there all the time now uh by both dealers and private individuals and it's it's definitely just interesting to keep stock of the overall health of magic when it comes to just looking at the higher end pages and seeing who's selling whatever quantity amount of cards so is there anything else that you want to talk about sig we can always have you on in the future just to touch on stuff we've talked about on the cast, but people really like getting a nice old school uh, magic and real life finance person to talk since you normally can't make our cast recording schedule. Sure, and I appreciate you taking some you know time separately so that I can get a little bit more exposure and share my thoughts. Hopefully people do appreciate it. I'm not sure if people can leave comments or whatnot, but yep. yeah, open to that. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll wrap up with is probably just beating the same drum again, but I think it's really important. You've, everyone has seen what, what Hasbro has been doing these last you know year or two years. They are reprinting like crazy, and they are creating all these new sets. You've got all these Commander products, and then you have these like kind of rehash of the dual, tech, dual decks with the anthologies and then the Commander deck anthologies. You've got your Eternal Masters, your Modern Masters, Conspiracy, where they've got all these reprints that seem out of place that are clearly there just to bring the value down of cards and so you the more you're, you're getting of that I'm sure it's selling a lot more product and it makes them a lot more money but it just makes me really nervous about committing significant amounts of money into individual cards that can be reprinted at any given time so I think when you're deciding to speculate on a card especially, but if you want to invest in something and think, oh, this is something you, you throw in a shoebox for five years and it'll make you some money, like just be careful with what you're, you're, you're putting away because I don't think that mantra holds true like it once did. And that's why I think putting money into, you know, if you don't like reserve list cards because they've all already jumped, like just look at stuff like random alpha and beta playable stuff that people use in old school or, or even like, you know, like beta swords to plowshares is a fortune now. It's it's over a hundred bucks, and you can't really find copies anywhere. Stuff like that is is golden as long as the game is healthy. So in in the world where of investing in standard and modern cards, you risk the game suffering. You know, secular shifts, meta game format shifts, and you risk you know the game um, you know losing popularity. Whereas with old school stuff, all you have you risk is the game's popularity. But as long as Wizards is making a million new sets, I don't think the game will lose popularity anytime soon. And so where can people find wisdom that you're going to write about in the future, your thoughts on certain events? So you can usually find me. I write uh, every Monday. My articles go live on quietspeculation.com. And I'm trying to be vocal on Twitter. I'm at SigFig8, the numeral 8. Um, you know, sometimes during the work day, I get kind of distracted by reality and all that. But if you tweet at me, ask me questions, engage, I generally try to engage as soon as I, I have a moment. So those are the best ways to reach me and i'm at zem at sells magic on twitter um for those listening on this fine saturday afternoon or sunday uh we're going to be recording our normal cast on monday but sig has a real life so he can't make it uh, we also have a representative from puka trade coming on within the next two weeks to talk about the failures of their system and how puka trade is an alleged pyramid scheme blah 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 he'll dissect all that stuff and we'll get to it but as always, we're going to leave you with one last piece of sweet, sweet cartel knowledge. Be careful when you're going to pirate school because you have to memorize the alphabet. And the alphabet for the pirate school has seven C's. As always, thanks for watching our sideboard with six seconds of SIG. And we'll see you guys next time.